Welcome to the local campaign and thank you for joining us for our debate for Ward 18 Alta Vista. In just a moment, I'm going to introduce the six candidates who will be debating today. But first, I'll go over the rules for how this is all going to work. Each candidate will have one minute to provide an opening statement to you, and then we'll move into a series of debates about the important topics in this election campaign in Alta Vista Ward and throughout the city of Ottawa. In each case, I will direct a question to one candidate. That candidate will have 45 seconds to answer on his or her own. Then we'll open it up to several minutes of free-flowing debate on that particular topic where the candidates can jump in at any time, challenge each other, offer their perspectives on that issue to you. And uh, we'll move through a series of different debates that way uh, until we uh, wrap up with closing statements. And we'll do those in the reverse order of the opening statements. Again, they'll be one minute in length. And the order for the opening and closing statements was determined at random before we began our telecast. So let's meet the candidates who are on the ballot in Alta Vista, Ward 18, in the October 22nd municipal election. They are Mike McHarg, Clinton Cowan, John Reddens, Jean Cloutier, Kevin Kitt, and Raylene Lang Dion. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here for the debate. And let's begin the opening statements with Mike McCard. Go, go ahead, you have one minute. Hi, I'm Mike McCard. I'm a local member of the Alta Vista community here, and I want to work with you to make the community and the city a better place for us all to live. I'm taking action in this election because I want to improve the quality of life of residents here by taking progressive actions that other councillors on, uh, on here aren't taking action of. Uh, the obesity epidemic is a major problem that needs addressing today. Uh, Two-thirds of adults and one-third of children are currently overweight, with this number expected to rise in the next several years. The World Health Organization has directly linked added sugar with the increase in obesity that we've been seeing recently. And so as your city councillor, I'd like to address that by implementing a beverage tax on sugar-sweetened beverages to help reduce the overall level of consumption, fight, fight obesity, and put more money back into the Ottawa hospital to help us. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next up is Clinton Cowan. Go ahead. You have up to one minute as well. Bonjour, Chimigwich. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Clinton Cowan. I'd like to start by sharing my gratitude for the confidence you've shown in me over the years to lead in these changing times two of our largest community serving organizations, both as president of the Alta Vista Community Association and our Southeast Ottawa Community Health Centre, serving four wards in the southern part of our city, an area covering, covering over 100,000, including seniors, families and marginalized communities. The path ahead is not one that will be for cruise control counselors, but for one that has a tr proven track record of building collaborations, removing barriers, and building on my 20 years of community experience. As an experienced negotiator and labor relations expert, with the, the scandals that we see now around the LRT contract and the naivety that we've seen from this council on this, what we expected from it, it's time for the skill set and the experience to carry our city forward. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next up is John Reddens. Go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to engage with your viewers on YouTube and as well as on the cable. I want to remind that we are on Algonquin territory. I'm running because I feel strongly that all voices are not being heard in our community. I am the best candidate because of my leadership throughout the years. Participating in municipal provincial politics, volunteering on various levels, such as an economic development chair, a volunteer firefighter know what they go through. OPP community policing. I worked with the OPP detachment in my hometown. Our son. My first priority is to build a partnership that will bring our community together. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Jean Cloutier, you're next. Go ahead. Thank you, Mark. Bonsoir. My name is Jean Cloutier and I'm running for re-election for city councillor in Alta Vista. I've lived in the ward for 31 years, served my community association for well over 20, and I'm an accountant by profession. In my first term, I met with hundreds of residents in their laneway and at more than 289 public meetings that I attended or arranged. We've paved roads, we've replaced water mains, and we've repaired sewers. As our community is now approaching 60 years, our challenge is to make sure that the city budget continues to allocate funds to meet our needs. I commit to you that I will continue to fight for more funding for infrastructure renewal so that we have infrastructure that is resilient, protects our homes, and make all forms of transportation easy and efficient. Securing large investments like the $50 million Valley Drive Sewer Project takes political skill of an experienced councillor with a solid track record. That is who I am. With your support, 
I hope to continue my work in the community addressing your concerns. Thank you. Kevin Kitt, go ahead. You have one minute as well. Thanks, Mark. The next Alta Vista City Councilor must be an effective listener, a strong advocate, and someone who brings people together. I love my community, and I am that person. The skill set that I provide is one of a community leader who listens, advocates, and has delivered results for Alta Vista. While my professional background as a federal auditor provides a value for money perspective that is needed at the council table. My Alta Vista plan built from voices all across the ward includes improving aging infrastructure, reducing speeding on streets, addressing affordable housing, and ensuring that community voices are heard on development proposals. In Alta Vista, I want to measure progress based on results, not on intentions. My energy, attention to detail, and passion for my community make me the ideal choice to become Alta Vista's next city councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, Raylene Lang-Dion, go ahead. I think it's important to also acknowledge that we're on unceded Algonquin territory. I'm running because I am greatly concerned about the future of our ward. We have issues such as Herongate, we've got drugs in our parks where the children play, and many, many more. It's obvious that Alta Vista needs a stronger and more collaborative voice at the decision-making table. So here today, you're going to hear similar issues, that's for sure, but what I would like to focus on would be skill sets, because that's what makes a difference down at City Hall. So let me tell you about myself. I'm an advocate for youth, homelessness, mental health, addictions, recovery. I've worked for two federal cabinet ministers and also at, at um, Queen's Park. So I've been listening to you, consulting you, and responding back to you. And that won't stop when I'm elected at City Hall. So I'm the candidate who will always fight for you. And I hope to rely on your vote come October 22nd. Thank you. All right. Thank you to all the candidates for your opening statements. Let's move into some debates now about the important issues in Alta Vista and throughout the city of Ottawa. I'll start with a question to Mike McHarg. You'll have 45 seconds on your own on this, and then we'll open it up to everyone for some debate. Let's get right into the discussion about the Herringate development uh, that a lot of residents have raised concerns about. How should that have been handled differently by the city? So thank you for that question, Mark. Uh, I think it's terrible what's going on with the Herringate community. Obviously, it's very important that we ensure that our families have a secure place to live and that, they are, that there is always a place for them in the future. Um, so with what's happening with Herringate, I do support increased, um, increased zoning for low-income housing. Uh, that is a need for our community to, to ensure that we are making sure that all families um, have a place to call home at night. Uh, and so I think that we need to increase the amount of zoning that we do for low-income housing to really provide them with that base there. Okay, it's open to everyone now on this topic. Well, I think Mark, it's I'd fair like to, to say that update. safe and affordable like housing is absolutely on the key. State of Heron Gate, um, 102 as of now, 102 out of those 105 families that received relocation notices have have been have re have found new homes, and it is through. We have to remember that uh, it is a private developer that applied for uh, relocation and demolition under the provincial statute, the Residential Tenancies Act. That does not mean that, the, that I, as the city councillor, does not have an important role to help those residents. And I've been to each one of those doors to assist them because of the, the commitment of Ottawa housing staff, our office, and the mayor's office. We secured more money for those families that were forced to relocate. And, um, and 102 out of the 105 have found new homes. The job of a councillor is to actually advocate and to speak up for the citizens. These, these citizens, the residents of Herringate, can you, you can't even imagine the situation, the living conditions that these folks were in. So yes, the issue is about affordable housing and the deplorable state of the city in terms of not having enough places for people to live. But before the current councillor signed off on anything or encouraged anything to happen with the developer, it should have been, I'm not doing a thing until you can guarantee me beforehand that everyone at that table, every one of those residences have a place to go to. Can you imagine the impact on their mental health over the last while and the possibility that they're actually going to be evicted again? I mean, it's absolutely unheard of and unacceptable. What, I, what I'd like to say on this is simply the fact that we must do more and I will do more. We need to work with the MPP to enforce the Residential Tenants Act 
make sure that infestation, mold, bed bugs are out of Herringate and, exactly. and are out of all affordable housing communities. We need also to make sure that we're ensuring that we're building affordable housing along transit lines. The problem in Herringate is a problem that's systemic across the city. We simply don't have enough affordable housing. I will fight to make sure that we get more. And finally, advocate for inclusionary zoning in the rental community. That's long overdue and we need it. We need a councillor who's present and is going to deliver results. There's a lot of fragility again today from these candidates about affordable housing and the experiences of Herringate. People speaking, grandstanding without actually understanding the context of living and how precious our affordable housing is. As a child, I had the, the I'm grateful for the opportunity when my family struggled, we stayed in a family shelter for a short time and we made our way up to staying in one of our affordable housing projects in the West End. We thought at a point if we could get ourselves together, maybe we could move to a beautiful community like Herringate because decades ago, Herringate was an attractive, planned community desirable by many. But like this city, its infrastructure and how it's governed, it treats people like, dis like they're disposable. We're running our city without an oil change, we're running our city on bald tires, and we need to look strongly. And in the past provincial election, I was the only voice that's up here that had the courage to have the conversation to talk about the real problem, that we need to change the pr Promoting Affordable Housing Act at Queen's Park. This is the tool that when municipalities adopt it, will transform how we go forward with inclusionary zoning. The current tool only works for owned properties and condominiums. And since there's been a drastic cooling off in the markets, pivoting towards rentals, and for the first time in a generation, we're seeing rental homes, be, rental housing being built all over. Many of the mega projects coming to Alta Vista are those that are for strictly rentals only. So changing okay. the tool to work for that, this is one that I keep working on, and I've been working on the provincial level, bringing together Sorry, community we'll health centers. Time for, for people. Uh, for John Reddens, go ahead, please. Um, I've been living there for 14 years. I know where the issues are. I gave up on the Ottawa housing because the waiting list is ridiculous. Housing issues. With, uh, renters are being ignored in this city for a long time. I believe in inclusionary zoning, an online registry. Toronto has it. It's one of the. It's a very effective way of telling people who are the better landlords, who are the worst landlords. Then you know you can decide the market where you want to go. But the thing is, landlords would rather pay for the fines than fix the issues. For example, landlords in the city supply tenants with non-working appliances. <coughs> The city had created a bylaw for the fix the issue. I was happy to be part of that process for the developments. It's crazy that you have to tell a landlord you have to have work in appliances. Okay. I, I just right. like to Go step ahead. in for 10 seconds on this. Uh, we talk about grandstanding. Clinton, I'm not grandstanding. As a community leader, I was the one who stood up, went on to change.org, and asked Councillor Clute as well as Timber Creek to get an extension on the secondary plan for Herringate so that we wouldn't rush to the council table. That That's the that kind of leadership like that Herringate. we need at City Hall. Okay, we'll have to stop there. Mike McCarg, I asked you the question, so you get the last 30 seconds on this topic. Thank you very much for that, Mark. I just want to reiterate how important it is to have inclusionary zoning for all families here in the district. I want to thank all the other councillors for their comments on this issue, as it is clearly something that's very important uh, to all of us here in Alta Vista Award. Uh, so I, as your councillor, I will fight to have that inclusionary zoning to make sure that there is, a, there is adequate housing for all residents here in the community. All right, we'll move to the next question now, which I'll direct to Clinton Cowan. There has been uh, some concern raised about fundraising events uh, by some people who are running for council in your ward. Uh, and the question has been asked, should city council candidates refuse donations from people associated with development companies, or should those donations be banned? What do you think the solution is here? You've got 45 seconds. All right, thank you for the question, Mark. It's an important one, and it's about trust and judgment. I stand for, a, I've stood for, as a longtime advocate for campaign financing reform because what polarizes our trust in our city hall and in our planning uh, approaches is that link and the perception that developers have the red carpet treatment when it comes to controlling and getting adva taking advantage of these matters. It, it displays a grievous lack of judgment to, in these, in these polarizing times, to continue to court and accept donations in that capacity. I'm the only one here that has the audited financials from previous campaigns that can demonstrate that I have never taken developers' contributions, and I commit to that again. Okay, it's open to everyone on this topic. Mark? There's been a whirlwind of activity since, uh, since that event was announced, and, and um, 
I firmly believe in everyone's democratic right to contribute to, to uh, candidates' campaign, and I'm honoured by those who have supported me. Al Steakhouse, the, the business where we're going to have that fundraiser, has received um, threats and intimidation, and that has no position in the democratic process. And so I'm announcing that I am suspending that activity as of right now and all other activities. No activities at the Rideau Club or fancy downtown Toronto Bay Street uh, fundraising activities. And people want to know who contributed to my campaign. Before they vote on October 22nd, I'm prepared to tell them. And my challenge is I think all candidates should disclose who is funding their campaigns before October 22nd. So I'm challenging all of you here to disclose by Wednesday, October 17th at 5 o'clock a complete list of those who have contributed to your campaigns. If we all agree, then Alta Vista residents can make an informed choice. I, Kevin, I fully Kevin support will you do that? that? I fully Absolutely. support that. We'll do that. I Absolutely. fully support that, and I think it's really important to demonstrate transparency, but also to be honest with people and lay everything out. So I will definitely commit to that, but I would also like to mention that I would like somebody who's neutral to be in charge of it to ensure that we all do so at the same time. I've so disclosed things very October clearly on my website in terms of my uh, decision a, a while ago not to accept any money from developers. There's also a item on my website disclosing my husband's professional occupation and some advice from uh, Mr. Marlowe at City Hall. And I look forward to receiving further conflict of interest instructions from Mr. Marlowe, and I would encourage the other uh, candidates to please do the same to ensure that everybody's playing above the board and according to the laws, which is what we should be doing. Thank you. I, I would just like to say on this that when I entered this uh, campaign, I told everybody that wanted to contribute to me that I was going to be looking at who they were and where they were coming from. Because before I cashed any checks, I wanted to make sure that there was no real or perceived conflict of interest. I've done that. As a federal auditor, I have a background in ensuring that we don't put ourselves in conflict of interest. And I can you can be rest assured that I will not be in that. I, and I will fully disclose uh, all my contributions. Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a good point by Councillor Clutier. Well, and disclose other things besides financial contributions. Is there family members that have certain positions? In anything. Anything that folks think could possibly create a conflict should I, be. And Kevin and I are used to having a conflict of interest. I have for many years in my day job. So it's just simply the right yeah. thing to do. I already disclosed where my conflict of interest is. Uh, um, the fact that that if I have to, if I run for, if I win for council, I'll resign from those positions. I deal with the uh, with the two sp professional sports groups in the city. So if, if I decide to win, I'll have to resign my position as a fundraiser. So, Jean Cloutier, just to be clear, you're saying that event that had created some controversy and raised some questions is not happening. That though. event is not happening. I've cancelled mm -hmm. all fundraising. Sure. If anyone wants to, contrib to my, sure. contribute to my campaign, they go to the website and they choose to contribute. And I think it's, I think it's important. I, I, I want money from persons who live in Alta Vista, not from persons uh, at other fundraisers in well, Toronto. I think the rules are open, Mr. Cloutier, for yeah. donations to come from all across Mr. Ontario. Precisely. And so I what it does is it actually shows, it actually shows that people yeah. are truly believing in your abilities. And I've been honoured to receive contributions from all parts of Ontario, most of them from Alta Vista. So it's an honor that people have so much confidence and I don't look at it in terms of a negative Can thing. Can I ask you, where, where did you have your fundraiser, in Alta Vista? Are you talking to me? Yes, I am. Um, I've had one of them in Alta Vista, I've had one of them downtown, I've had one of them in the West End, and I've actually had one of them in Toronto. If I was a small business owner in Alta Vista, how would I feel? Um, Small business owners in Alta Vista are actually quite pleased with me, and several have endorsed me with uh, signs in their windows. So but thank you, you, local business but owners. So have you told them exactly that you had a fundraiser out of the out of the out of the uh, Alta out of the Vista? Board? Um, no, I haven't, John. I tend to talk to them about what we can do to improve business and the situation in Alta Vista and any concerns that they have in relation to what would be going on um, down at City Hall. I just like to point out that with all the bickering back and forth in terms of uh, fundraisers, I've had held no fundraisers and I'm, my campaign is supported strictly by individual residents in Alta Vista. Thank you.
So Mark, okay, just to close we'll the stop loop. there. No, Everybody we have to stop there. That's their, time. Their I asked Clinton Cowan on. the question, so uh, Clinton Ka uh, Cowan, you get the last 30 seconds here. Thank you, Mark. This is an issue that has come up because of the ongoing pattern of entitlement to receive these donations. I have stood as a champion for transparency, and I continue to do so. It's interesting to see that Councillor Gluche is now following a lead that I set as an initiative to call for real-time campaign finance donations in 2014. It's time that we break the chains that the developers have in our city and take it back for ourselves. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to the next question, which I'll address to uh, John Reddens. Would you support a return to weekly garbage collection, uh, specifically in the summer months or year-round? Funny you ask that question, because I do believe you asked me that same question four years ago. I do support... Uh, it's weekly. not intentional, just so <laughs> <you know. laughs> I support that, that uh, weekly, uh, next uh, weekly garbage pickup in the summer, and uh, I also strongly believe if we if we're going to run a recycling program when it came out we should have had a proper educational program right now we're just catching up but we're still fall, lacking behind i still people see people using their their uh, in especially in apartment buildings use uh, their recycle bags as shopping shopping bags that's it's basically it's it's educational it has to be taught from the start Okay, and I, I don't remember the questions I asked four no. years ago, but uh, it was number three on my list and you're number three drawn at random, that's how it turned out, so kind of a funny coincidence, it's open to everyone now. Mark, we have to talk about what we're actually putting on the curb and what can we reduce in that supply. Right now we have to talk about, we are in a crisis point with our plastics recycling programs in North America as China has changed the game. China is no longer accepting impure plastic streams uh, in its recycling program because they used to receive over 50% of what we sent out of North America. Now we have municipalities across North America that are now looking for disposal permits incineration permits to get rid of the glut of plastics that are around. So we must take bold action because we have not seen anything, any real movement in our climate action plan here in our city. And we need to look and be bold and talk about banning single-use plastics. We need to look at not, not cutting, as you've asked, um, doubling our waste recycling, uh, garbage recycling, but actually upgrading and more frequent um, composting and moving it directly to multi-residential units. That's one of the failures of the Green Bin program is that we put this solely on uh, homeowners with houses and we, we, we tiptoed into this and this is what's part of this exacerbated this Green Bin debate. I fully agree with everything that Clinton has said and in particular in Alta Vista, I don't know if the other candidates are noticing this, but the increasing problem that we're having with rats and then coyotes as such um, in the bins, I mean it's absolutely getting out of control. So if we don't deal with one problem effectively Effectively, we have an outcome, and it's not a particularly safe outcome whatsoever. What, and another thing is important is is property standards. We have a mess with some of these landlords that it has to be addressed by by force, forcing better rules for for bylaw to have some teeth in it. Right now, where it's just this uh, tap and do this, uh, we'll be back in ten days. The, uh, the, and the bylaw doesn't have time to come back in 10 days. The fact is that garbage is the most expensive way to dispose uh, in, in the long term. We have to talk about landfills and where those landfills are. We also have to keep into consideration the markets for our recycling products and, and, and that, is a, that is a big issue. Um, the city, uh, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, is an important partner in this, and we are moving to full producer payment of recycling. It is a big issue that we are going to have to deal with in the city of Ottawa and in Alta Vista, because there might be a time in the future, very shortly, where the, uh, the disposal of those recycling products won't be the city's responsibility, it could go to producers. So we need to absolutely be on top of that file to ensure that, that we serve our population well and that we don't pass this problem along 20, 30, 40 years to our children. Our dump is on its last legs and one of the things that's exacerbating this problem is if we are not adequately recycling, reducing our consumption of, of unnecessary consumer plastics, um, we need to look at the bigger picture of our industrial and commercial sector and including our development sector. When somebody buys a home in Alta Vista for maybe $500,000, the cost to demolish and dispose of that house and throw it in the dump 
is t about twenty thousand dollars on a project. Once you're building a new home, that's that's a rounding that's a rounding calculation. We need to be serious about looking at the charges that we assign for demolition permits because we're throwing good, strong, beautiful houses in Alta Vista into the dump, and then when we're building new, beautiful, exciting homes that integrate into the community. 55% of the matter that is used to build those buildings goes into the dump in the waste stream. So we're not building efficiently, and it's also ramping up and shortening the life of our dump. And it will cost all taxpayers millions of dollars, millions, to at least $250 million is the new estimate for uh, acquiring a new dump. And which community will that be in? It must be in the city of Ottawa. And we just can't believe that we have this hinterland. It is grade A agricultural land. It is sensitive bogs and green spaces. So we must be mindful about what we're doing with our environment, how we're buying things, and how we're building things. Let, let, Alta, Vista, let Alta Vista take the lead on this because the city of Ottawa right now has one of the lowest waste diversion rates across the entire province. It's at about 46 or 47 percent. And a York Durham, I believe, is coming in at around 68 or 69 percent. So there's been a lot of talk about, yes, how are we, we need to address it, but how are we going to do it? Well, let's promote recycling and uh, getting the green bins into multi-residential uh, buildings across the, across the ward. The City of Toronto has championed this. I would, as City Councilor, get into those buildings and make sure that superintendents and landlords are aware of recycling so that we can get the ball rolling. And yeah. if we can improve our waste diversion by only 1%, we will extend our landfill by one year. I, as City Councilor, want us to get 2 or 3% over the next term of council, at the very least. We should do this, and I will champion this in Alta Vista. And what I, visited, I would champion I in downtown would have to be about to when it comes okay. to the <laughs> different uh, ways of raising awareness. Because if we're not raising awareness, the fantastic ideas that Kevin was just mentioning are not going to be implemented, right? So I know folks do that in school already, but let's just keep doing it because it's really important for that next generation. I visited municipalities from here to Halifax, and I talked with residents about their compost and their green bin and, and their recycling programs and I said what makes it work and what makes it so successful and they said because the city supported it and supported it in a tangible fashion there's a big ick factor for some with the green bin and we're, we've we've compromised the quality of the the out the output of our green bin program by now allowing dog feces and plastic bags going in there other municipalities have actually provided, because it's cheaper to do this, the paper wax bags that go in those kitchen containers that makes it user friendly so we can save money and save space in our dumps. Mm -hmm. Okay, John Reddens, I asked you the question, you get the last 30 seconds on this. Garbage. It's a big issue. Uh, it needs to, the plan needs to be reviewed. What we're doing is not enough. It's got to be, it's got to get, it's got to get tougher. It's got to get tougher with, with, uh, with bad landlords as well, they're they're one of the biggest enemies. We got to do to we got we got to educate tenants. Uh, one of the fastest, and that's the, that's the bottom line is education and knowledge. Okay, we'll move on to the next question, which I'll direct to Jean Cloutier. Uh, we have, of course, have learned in the in the last couple of weeks that light rail is going to be further delayed, and that there are costs that could be incurred by the city as a result of that. That's still going to be sorted out, presumably during the next term of council. Should you as a city councillor and other city councillors have provided better oversight of this project and what can be done to make sure that there aren't more issues like this during phase two and phase three? Light rail is a transformative issue for our ward and for our city. It is a billion dollar project that will go east to west and it will improve the, the transit in our city. What I think is very important is that we hold Rideau Transit Group to their contract, that we not be flippant about making um, a, a light rail system that is not ready to go. We do not want the light rail to start to open up before it has been fully tested. We do not want light rail transit to be a, a phoenix that has been launched without proper testing. So I fully support that, that 
whatever delay, the delay that we have. Mm -hmm. All right. I understand the delay that it's we have. It's open to everyone and now. You can keep, yeah. you can finish your there's thought. A, there's a I understand the delay that we have, but it's important that it be safe and secure. I think we can all agree that the people of Alta Vista depend upon safe and reliable, but most importantly, affordable public yeah. transportation. The LRT, surely folks should have known that there was going to be a delay. I mean, that does happen for sure. But then what's the backup plan, right? The backup plan should have been, hey, we're not going to give those pink slips to the bus drivers. No, instead, we're going to increase the number of buses because we know that the LRT is going to be delayed. Like, for sure, this is basic stuff. And before we go on to talk about the next stage of the LRT, it's really important that we get it right. It's really important to re have reestablish that trust. But also, it's really important for folks to know what is the plan and how much more money and to what end. The, the LRT, RTG, it's a fixed price contract. All the penalties will and all the costs will be applied to uh, RTG as per as per the contract. John, the math and already doesn't add up. We have we already have a ten million dollar defi deficit, and we're we're only penalizing them one million dollars for the deadline. The, that um, all all the costs for detours will will be passed along to RTG, and they will be fully fully held to complying with the contract that they have signed. And, and that is very important to protect the taxpayers of our city. So how are people supposed to get around in the meantime? The I mean, that's the question. The will continue. The buses, the buses are delayed. Will run. The buses don't the show. Buses There's run. a problem with is, the bus. And Raylene, that is why the LRT is so important for our city. That is why it is so important <clears throat> that we launch it correctly and that it be reliable and that it be safe. And that is what I, as a city councilor, will hold RTG to so, do. So so let, moving ahead, okay, uh, what we need to do is improve communication. We need to make sure that FEDCO is meeting on a regular basis with RTG and that those meetings are then uh, are being briefed to city council so that city councillors then can provide updates to residents about what's going on. As a councillor around the council table, I would ask this first question. Given all the delays on phase one and given that the fact that phase two is going to be scheduled to roll out in uh, 2019, are there going to be any impacts on the construction start for phase two? And if so, what are we going to do to make sure that we get it back on track? Good These time. are the kind of questions that we need to ask. This is the kind of background that I have as a federal auditor to provide that level of detail. And I, you can better believe that those uh, and that information will be getting back to residents in Alta Vista. And phase two is in the procurement process, and and we do have to improve that contract when we do provide that contract for to make sure that if there are any additional costs for detours, that it is included in that contract. It is not launching in 2019. It's scheduled in 2022, the first phase, but we are entering the procurement process. But are we going to wait till the LRT is run, run in phase one? Right now, Ed Edmonton has the same uh, computer system on there on their transit system and they don't have any running trains because of it. Just as a correction there, uh, yeah. phase two for the LRT, uh, which is the north-south line, is scheduled to be completed in 2022, not to begin construction in 2022. Thanks. This is a, a question of due diligence. And we see that when the discussions about the phase two contract were coming up, there was a lone counselor who was bold enough to say, we need to slow this down and make sure we're getting it right. And I'm not gonna, I don't wanna name drop who this counselor is, but she serves a community just south of us. Yeah. And again, that's a, that's a contract yeah. as thick as a phone book. And I'm, uh, I'm, I, I function as a high level negotiator. I work, I, I work, I work at win-win agreements against Fortune 500 companies. I've been recruited by the Canadian Audit and Accountability Foundation to bridge the gap between just accepting auditors' reports to actually have bridging the gap for counselors to have the humility to implement them. So this is a question of transparency as well. RTG is a group and they have their own trade secrets that they need to protect. But the problem is, is that we have a very lack of democracy in our budget making process and it's very closed off from even the councillors that they're shut out from it. This We can't go forward with phase two with the same operating agreement that it's only one person who receives this information, holds it against their chest and then after a budget is passed then reveals, oh by the way, it's going to be late. Where's the trust in that leadership and where are the councillors that are on transit committee, on FedCo questioning, deeping, yeah. Digging deep and saying with tenacity that I have to say we need answers and we need to know. Yeah.
It's a risk for our residents. Yeah. It's a risk for our citizens. Our transit system is in disarray, and we need to have real leadership that understands that this impacts the quality of life of residents across okay. our city Other and our reputation in, so. across the country. Yeah. Uh, that councillor down south of us is asking for an audit. I'm asking for a complete audit of all the operations. Exactly. It's a disaster. Even I, I, I'm a user of paratransport. We have major issues with that. Aid. We can't even get a scanner for a Prestel card. We can't even, it takes up, we're spending more time on paperwork, paperwork, paperwork on the drivers are getting us moving than we do driving. It's ridiculous. Well, driving and moving, it's how we have traffic issues in Alta Vista. And one of the issues that I'm hearing from residents across, this, across Alta Vista and the pulse check across the city is simply, you know what, getting onto the LRT, getting onto the trains that are full at Herdman. One more thing. Residents are saying, you know what, my parking pass at Terras is only $81. It's reliable and gets there on time. I'm going to check it. I'm checking out of OC Transpo yeah. because it's not effective. It's not... Um, or okay, reliable. Okay, we're going to stop there. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll go back to uh, Jean Cloutier. I asked you the question, so you get the final 30 seconds. Thank you, Mark. RTG asked to carve mm -hmm. out certain <clears throat> portions of the contract, and they could have delivered the LRT on November 2nd or November 30th. Staff didn't blink. This council didn't blink. We are holding RTG to ensuring that they deliver the system that they promised to deliver, that they are contractually obligated to deliver. They will pay the penalties that are appropriate, they will pay the costs that are appropriate, and we will not send them another penny until they deliver the LRT as contracted. Okay, let's move to a question for Kevin Kitt. Would you support photo radar on residential streets to improve safety, and where would you prioritize, since there are limited funds, where would you prioritize road safety within Alta Vista Ward? Thanks, Mark. 100% I would support uh, photo radar on residential streets, especially around school zones. That's the first thing. Speeding is not solved by a one-size-fits-all approach. We need to involve residents. They know their the streets best. They see their problems 24 uh, hours a day, seven days a week. Advocate for an extension of the $40,000 into the councillor's budget for temporary traffic calming measures, for speed display boards, and other things like that. That's a great thing. Also, we need to reduce the speed limit on streets. As a community association president, I was very instrumental in converting one of our streets in, into a complete street, and that speed limit eventually is going to be reduced from 50 to 30 when the build-out of the Elmvale Secondary Plan uh, is done. Okay. So Thank you. Everyone I, I fully agree with what Kevin had to say and it made a lot of sense. Very true. One thing that I will mention is that I'm sure we could agree that a $3,000 optical illusion that looks like something a Star Trek emblem is not going to do anything to help with speeding yeah. in our streets. And Kevin, I'm fully with you in terms of supporting Florida Radar. People again and again at the door are completely saying that we've got to have more of a physical presence, yeah. a police physical presence in the world and photo radar is their second thing they'd like to include. Photo radar will Thank be you. rolled out and uh, in school zones and I absolutely support that. In terms of temporary traffic calming and what Raylene you just alluded to, the, um, the virtual 3D speed hum mm -hmm. on Othello, yeah. it is just another pilot project of another tool that we can use to reduce, um, to improve driver behavior in our community. We gathered data before it went in, we'll gather data after, and we'll evaluate it, and if it's proven to be effective, then councillors can use that. It's, it's absolutely it, ridiculous. It's like 3000 over $3,000 that's just really demonstrating a lack of judgment. I mean, even though it is $3,000, it still is a lot of money to me, which could possibly be used elsewhere in our ward to help yeah. other folks. Yeah, it could have been. It's all about priorities in our exactly. world, it's, and it's and we can name a lot of things like, mm -hmm. like affordable transit is another. Um, we can also look at uh, the uh, Alta Vista, the uh, right on here in Road, the uh, bike lanes that they put in there is they, uh, the the loaders were cracked up all the pavement there. All they did was a patch job. It's the roughest, it's like driving a four-wheel drive down there. I absolutely support also gateway signage in our community. It will be coming, 
and uh, we want to implement that in certain areas in Alta Vista and uh, it will be available throughout the city and that too will will make it for a simpler process to reduce speeds in our in our residential areas and let's talk about evidence-based decisions you know how in our ward we've got those speed lights that blink at you when you're going too fast and they thank you when you're going too slow well having a conversation with some folks are saying, great, yes, they work. But every year there's a $40,000 budget where the local councillor can actually choose where, you know, with a bit of consultation, choose where those signs actually go. Fantastic. But wouldn't it be great if we were actually basing all of it strictly on evidence base and not necessarily who lobbies the councillor the loudest? So I think going forward, that $40,000, let's put it to real good use, along with having more crossing guards around schools. I mean, let's just do the things that make, safe, make sense and actually use the monies that we currently have a little bit more prudently. I spoke of the 289 consultations and meetings, and those traffic calming consultations are absolutely part of it. Where those digital boards go, uh, traffic calming on Coronation Avenue and, and other flex states throughout the ward are absolutely part of those consultations. We have focused on schools. It is a very important part of the ward and, uh, and, and that is where safety is, is so important. Safety is my top priority well, in, in managing traffic. With, with, all, with all due respect to um, the city councillor to my right, when you put in the paint on the road on Othello Avenue near the Elmville Mall. I'm president of the community association. I went and talked to residents on Othello, Olympia, streets in and around that area. And they told me they didn't understand why that was being done because the councillor hadn't spoken with them. Now I understand you spoke with a few of the residents, but what I would have liked to have seen is a reach out to me as the community association president to convene a meeting and to say, we're thinking about doing this. Yes. The evidence yep. says that this might work. Mm -hmm. Are you in favor of this? Will you support this? You never reached out to me as a community association president. There was no meeting convened. I can tell you right now, as city councillor, the first call I would have been making is to the president of the community association to make sure that key stakeholders and all residents had a voice. Exactly. Yeah, Raine talked, about, Raine talked about using data, and we will absolutely use data. In, in terms of whether we accept this, which is a pilot project, or whether it, it, we find that it, it has not given the results that we expected. I absolutely support that we should use data. Mark, to speak to your question about where to use photo radar, where it should be implemented, I'm glad that there's a lot of um, support for this and the late, late to the conversation and the advocacy for it, because back in 2012, I, as a community member, uh, reached out and as a director in the ABCA, to uh, your predecessor and said, hey, let's get this gateway sign, let's get this gateway signage thing going. And he, his response at the time was, well, I don't want to flush my political capital with the minister on working on this. When it comes to uh, photo radar, I've been a long supporter of uh, opening up the toolkit that is cost effective and is revenue neutral for taxpayers to bring calm to our streets. This is an important thing and I mobilized the ABCA, the Alta Vista Community Association and partners to work with the councillors who had the courage to go to Queen's Park to challenge this, to open up the rules for bringing back photo radar. So where do we put it? We put it in the community safety zones. Our community safety zone rules for doubling the fines has existed for over 20 years and our municipality has been timid to use the true tools available. But beyond that, there's a lot of wishful thinking about invest more, spend more, get more, but unless we democratize the budget, unless we have the courage to rebalance the conversation at City Hall and take the budget out of the mayor and his manager's hands and put it back in the citizens' hands through their Quite city fact. councillors, there is no Quite way fact. that any of these wishful thinkings will actually occur. Quick fact, 55% of Ontarians want the mayor office across Ontario, not the not to do the budget. They want the city, All the right, whole complete you. city. Thank you. So we'll go back to Kevin Kitt. I Thanks. asked you the question. You get the last 30 seconds. Thanks, Mark. As I mentioned at the outset, it's not solved by a one-size-fits-all approach. We need to involve residents uh, on a very consistent basis because they know their streets the best. The final thing I'd like to mention on speeding is that we have a really unique opportunity in 2019 to update the 2012 Strategic Road Safety Action Plan. Push. I would push to incorporate the uh, principles of Vision Zero so that we can better engineer and educate our residents about safety on roads. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Let's move now to a question for Raylene uh, Langdion. Um, there, uh, there have been a lot of people raising concerns about uh, where the city is investing money and concerns about infrastructure and other social services that they're not mm -hmm. getting enough funding. Mm -hmm. So where would you set tax increases for the next four years and what would you do about that pressure on spending that some mm -hmm. people feel mm -hmm. has been growing for the last few years? Well, let me start off with how I always approach the conversation about tax increases. Because I really think it's important to say to people, say to the residents of Alta Vista, do you feel that you're getting good worth for your money? I have yet to come across anybody who's saying, yes, they do feel like they're getting really good value for their money. So I think what we need to do first before, Mark, we talk about any tax increase would be to actually look at the money that we're spending now. Take for example, the road behind my house on Clooney Street cost us over $60 million and folks refer to it as the road to nowhere. So it's right around Chio and then going down to Riverside. Could we actually have used that money a little bit better and perhaps on other priorities? Or we can get into what's known as the tax levy for the Cloutier, Cloutier tax for the rink. Okay. It's open I think to there's other now. ways to actually spend the money a little bit more prudently. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard from residents that they want to keep property taxes at 2% in and around the rate of inflation. But it's important to note also that the cost of many city services is actually increasing above the rate of inflation. So we need to create greater efficiencies at the table. As a federal auditor, I have that background in value for money. Last year, just as an example, we spent $50 million on new roads or widening existing roads. If we literally took 10, 11, or $12 million of that 50 and reallocated it into areas where we really need to address things in the city, we would be so much further ahead. Affordable housing, the environment, our police, uh, our police force. This is the kind of attention to detail and challenge function that I would provide around the table. I support an increase in taxes that provides the services and that makes service to our community and their safety the highest priority. I understand the, the consumer price index is not, doesn't relate well to the cost of city services, but it is what residents know and is, it is what residents understand. On that basis, a 2% tax increase seems reasonable and is one that I would support, but I would absolutely support prioritizing the, the budgets for our infrastructure, which, which is in a critical state, and for the other elements such as traffic calming that, that are so important for would our residents. Challenge, would you challenge the mayor's office in front of the public? I will challenge the mayor's office in front of the public to make sure that the residents of Alta Vista get the value for their money and that their concerns are prioritized. So you talk about value for money, but what, some, what nobody's mm -hmm. raised right here today has to be the park in lieu, uh, cash in lieu payments for parklands. So right now, somewhere there exists over $850,000 money for this ward to be used on parks, improvements, children's playgrounds, splash pads, or how about some good old-fashioned seats for seniors, benches for seniors in the parks. And you have to kind of, you know, question a bit, right? What's going on here? Why has that money been allowed to accumulate and in a really transparent and accountable fashion? Why has the money been able to, been able to accumulate to such a high number? Rating and there. considering that there are so many needs in our parks for our children and the differences around the wards when it mm -hmm. comes to one park will be yeah. extremely well done, another park is absolutely suffering, I think it's deplorable um, yeah. that we've let this happen in our ward. And what a great opportunity we have over next council to actually spend that money diligently. Really, and cashing you of parkland is uh, money that is received by the ward to to improve our parks but there's yes, some confusion as to how it can be used it's governed by the well, planning it's, act it's very it clear. can be used only to acquire new public parks and only to increase capacity when there is growth you put out a twitter that said we should a tweet, uh, a tweet, a tweet. Uh, for and play equipment or sports yeah, fields or park all, benches, it's all but online, it cannot sir. be used. It cannot be used well, for those I encourage purposes. the public to go online and take a look so, for yourself yeah. in terms of what it lists that you can spend very, the money for yeah. and what you can't spend the money Cash for. And you Thank you. Parkland is very important we'll for our wards. We'll pick up the tab at the Moody's Bay for the shortfall that the company that didn't, that didn't come up. Who put up the, the extra amount that wasn't spent? I believe... Uh, Moody's Bay is not in Alta Vista, but it is a city park. And well, that's a good example of how the finance and on parks. And also the fact that uh, I, uh, 
uh, Ottawa Sun ran an article in February, most of these announcements of these new parks happen during election years. It should be all, it should be transparent and consistent. And consistent. I in, believe in, in transparency. In the last election, I committed to improving five parts, and, and they, are, they are listed, and we executed that plan. And in my platform, I commit to, to improving uh, many other parts, and I will execute that plan. Parks are vital to the health, to the socialization, and to the safety of our community. You promised lights for the... Uh, the park at uh, the at the uh, off of uh, Heron Gate. It's a safety issue. It's you know, a safety there's, issue. There's, you know, Raylene touched on something yeah. about the disparity of the parks around Alta Vista yeah. and how and how they're invested in and when they're invested in. Yes. I, I can say, as a community association president in Alta Vista, uh, go, going through uh, working with residents closely, uh, so w working and building a consensus on what we want to invest when life cycle replacement comes up, uh, what our parks will become, is participating in local fundraising uh, to raise money and I've, I've led recently a capital minor partnership grant through the city to help uh, increase the amount of funds available for the improvements of, of Alta Vista Park. But when we look at other parts of the ward where we have um, a levy that was uh, applied here in our ward yes. for something that I, I will say is pretty cool, yeah. but how we got there was not it's cool. Wrong. It wasn't cool at all. After the wrong. fact that we, we the rules were changed to a higher threshold that requires 75% of re area residents to agree with a f an assessed and with an assessed property value of over 50% of the ward. Now the question comes back to what Mark asked: is getting more funds and where should we invest? And I can say, in the past term at council, I've worked in coalitions across this city to get more funding in our budget for our social infrastructure in our city because the city is not keeping up with the needs of its residents right. it's only it's not keeping up on, it's fiddling with the numbers about per capita versus population and changing the changing the game so that we treat people with dignity so yes. that we're able to provide services there's a lot of hardship and it takes a lot of grit to hang on in today's Ottawa and we need to realize that we are humans we need help and our taxes is in the most beautiful way that I've heard taxes described came from the mouth of a five-year-old taxes her, is how we share her, and we need to to be clear and care about say? care about each other in our city. We have to be clear. We need true transparency. You have to say on that. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here. Um, obviously, I do support the taxes tax increase in our city if it is going to provide valuable services to our citizens here. I believe that we need to support the infrastructure in our cities to make sure that we're building uh, cities for the future uh, to ensure that we can all have a place to live uh, that's not crumbling down again. Okay, we'll stop there. Um, Raylene Langdion, I asked you the question, you get the last 30 seconds. Thank you, Mark. Just to let folks know, I'm a social progressive, but I really believe in being financially prudent, and maybe that's my Newfoundland roots, but devil's in the details when it comes to running the ship and the budget and how you spend money. But most importantly, it's about consulting and consulting and consulting the residents and having that conversation and the feedback so that they feel that their voices are being heard, which they don't feel currently at the moment. So let's build on that. Let's create a really great, okay. viable... That's time. Okay. Bye Thank yourself. you. Uh, we'll have to stop there. Uh, and we're now going to move to the closing statements. Again, we're going to do those in the reverse order of the opening statements. The order for that was drawn at random before our telecast. Each candidate will have one minute to speak to you, the voters in Alta Vista Ward, and we will start with Raylene Lang-Dion. Go ahead. Thank you. If I can leave you with one thing today, it's always that I'm going to fight for you down at City Hall. After this, after all, this is really your city and it's my city as well. And the job of an elected official is to speak up, fight for you, consult you, and really Here's what it comes down to is responding to your concerns. It's critical to have a strong voice at City Hall, to be treated with respect, and to know that your input actually counts and people are listening to you. So since I started knocking on doors last October, I've been listening, consulting, and reporting back to you. And that's not going to stop once elected at City Hall. It's my experience that sets me apart from the other candidates, experience that I want to use to help folks in the ward. So as you're making your decision, think about how I'll fight for you. I have an understanding of complex issues, and I'm used to advocating on people's behalves. So please consider giving me your support. See RaylenLangDion.ca for more information. Thank okay. you. Merci. Miigwech. Thank you. Next up is Kevin Kitt. You have one minute as well. Alta Vista residents have an important, important choice to make in this election. 
When you're casting your ballot on October 22nd, please think about the community you want for your family and who you can trust to put the people of Alta Vista first. My public record demonstrates that I listen, I advocate, and I achieve results for my community, and I can hit the ground running and get things done. My Alta Vista Action Plan is built from voices across the ward. It's our plan and it's our roadmap for the next four years. As your city councillor, I will answer the call on the, priori on the priorities that matter to you, including improving aging infrastructure, reducing speeding on streets, and ensuring that community voices are heard on development proposals. But most of all, my commitment to all of you is this. I will be your advocate, your voice, and your champion because I love my community of Alta Vista. On October 22nd, I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Jean Cloutier. Go ahead. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to my fellow candidates for accepting my challenge to post your donors on the, your websites by Wednesday, October 17th at 5 p.m. I think it's important for transparency. In closing, Alta Vista needs an experienced community leader who understands the complexities of municipal politics. Needs a leader who's committed to consulting with residents. I am that leader. I am not afraid to find innovative ways to ensure that the much needed infrastructure works are undertaken. I'm a proven leader who will work hard to address the safety concerns and ensure that Alta Vista remains to be one of Ottawa's most desirable neighbourhoods. I recommit to you, as in my first term, that I am just a phone call away and that I will continue to work closely with our neighbourhood community associations. Let's stand together to make sure our voice is heard at City Hall. And on that, I ask for your vote on October 22nd. All right, thank you. Next is John Reddens. Go ahead. 14 years ago, I moved to Ottawa. I've been fighting for 12 years for the middle and low income. Since 2010, I've been on a disability pension. I know how to budget. I know how to, I know how to set priorities. I, I know how, what, what to tell people that I can't, I can't do this. I know when not to tell people, yes, I, we can go ahead and do this. I know how to make decisions, be based on, on my, my living ability. I can, that's how I'll treat City Hall. I'll treat it as if it's, it's your money, not anyone else's. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Clinton Cowan, you're up next, go ahead. I'd like to say thank you for sticking with us to the end of this broadcast and this video. Um, so talking about these issues is obviously a little difficult for some, but when you've been in the center of a lot of the conversations, the complex issues for over 20 years in our city, working in neighborhoods, removing barriers, building partnerships and coalitions in our neighborhoods, across our city, and now across the province, working on the issues of the day that affect you and our quality of life, I have a question for you. Are you ready? to have four more years of the same in these uncertain times with Queen's Park and what's happening south of the border. I offer myself as a trusted, experienced and proven community leader, ready to take the bold steps to move our community forward together. I believe in Alta Vista and I believe in on October 22nd, it's time for us to choose a new councillor who is ready to work with you. Together, we can save our city. Thank you. Finally, Mike McCard, you have 60 seconds as well. Go ahead. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to thank the viewers for taking the time to learn about some of the local issues impacting them here in the community. Uh, it's important for a democracy to have a very well-informed uh, voter so that they are able to uh, best choose the councillor that aligns with their values. So if you value fighting back against obesity, if you value uh, cleaning up the community and reducing the amount of single-use plastics that are used here in the city, then vote Mike McCard. Vote me on October 22nd. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to all the candidates for participating in our debate for Ward 18, Alta Vista. Good luck the rest of the way. And I'll remind our viewers that Election Day is October the 22nd. That's when you'll be able to vote. And you'll also be able to see live coverage of the results of this municipal election and analysis of what it'll mean for the next four years of city government right here on Rogers TV and also simulcast on 1310 News Radio. Join us starting at 8 o'clock when the polls close on October the 22nd. Thank you for watching.